Southwest every fall, there's always a big mess. And the funniest part of it is almost always the result of well-meaning people trying to be helpful. What's the problem? It starts with hunters, and the hunters are breaking a basic rule. It's a simple rule. You leave gates the way you found them. You just leave them exactly the way you found them. What happens is hunters might be driving along and see a closed gate. And typically in our part of the country, that's just a piece of barbed wire fence laying down. So they'll pick it up and close it. Or they'll see an open gate and figure, well, we'll leave it open for the next guy who comes along. So he won't have to get out of the pickup and open the gate. Anyway, by the time someone finally comes along and fixes everything, it isn't unusual to have cattle scattered from here to breakfast. They're all over the country. There's good, commonsensical reasons for leaving gates the way you found them. And especially if you don't know why the gate's like that, you're the last person that ought to mess with it. It's most likely been left open or closed for darn good reason, and you need to respect that and not think you have a better idea. So unless a guy knows that for sure that the gate was left in the wrong position by someone ahead, he's always supposed to leave the gates the way he found them. Now, my recent trip home got me really thinking about this rule. When I walked into a Catholic church in central Montana where I was supposed to baptize this little baby, and I had to look around, all I could think of was, Dad Gummit, why can't they just leave gates the way they find them? Now, what am I talking about? Were there gates in the church? No, there weren't any gates at all. I said that because of the architecture and arrangement of the church. What does that have to do with leaving gates the way you found them? It has everything to do with it. This principle applies more to just gates in the country. If you don't know why something is like it is, you shouldn't mess with it. It's just common sense. For example, imagine a teenager ignoring this rule with his dad's car. He decides he wants to take a real close look at the engine, so he pops open the hood. And gee, he says to himself, what are all these wires and hoses and things? How am I ever going to see the engine with all this stuff in the way? So he gets out his pliers and goes to work and rips out the wiring harness and all the vacuum lines. He may indeed get a closer look at that engine, but that car isn't going to go very far anymore, is it? If you don't know why something is like it is, you shouldn't mess with it. That principle applies to customary or traditional ways of doing things and for exactly the same reasons. It applies to that church. See, the architecture when I walked in that church was totally whacked. When you look over here, here's a lunch counter with the coffee pots in the kitchen. There's the lunch tables. Behind the lunch tables in the corner is the statue of the Blessed Mother and St. Joseph. Right next to the lunch tables is a pulpit. There's an altar. Right next to it are some big, ugly potted plants. Hidden by, behind the potted plants in a corner is a very ugly thing that's an excuse for tabernacle. And all this is filled up with folding chairs all on the same exact level. It's absolutely and completely whack. They totally missed the idea. What's wrong there? They have a complete misunderstanding of two basic concepts, what it means to be holy and what it means to be profane. Those concepts need to be expressed in the layout of a church. First concept, holiness or sanctity. Holiness means the state of purity. It means freedom from sin. It means sanctity. The basic idea is that holiness pertains to things which are set apart for and dedicated to the worship of God. There are holy persons, places, things, and times. Persons, like nuns. Places, like Catholic churches. Things, like chalices and times, like Sundays and holy days of obligation. And there are degrees of holiness. Obviously, the tabernacle has a lot higher degree of holiness than the Stations of the Cross, even though they're both holy and dedicated to God's worship. The degrees of holiness also determine the care and reverence that we have to use when we approach these things, huh? We have to treat holy persons, places, things, and times differently and reverently because in some special way they've been given over to God. That's holiness. Second concept, profane. Profanity directly contrasts with holiness. Profane means not sacred, common, 
not devoted to sacred purposes, unconsecrated, secular, not pure, worldly, or unholy. Someone who profanes things is a man who either by his words, which we call profanities, or by his actions treats sacred things with irreverence. He treats sacred things as if they're ordinary or common. So holiness, on the one hand, means to be set aside, consecrated, and devoted to the worship of God. And profaneness means to not be sacred, to be not devoted to the worship of God, to not possess any particularly holiness, to be worldly. Now, as every Catholic knows, churches are consecrated by a bishop. That's a lengthy ceremony. It takes hours, and it sets that place totally apart for the worship of God. That means a church is some kind of holy place, and it's not just an elementary school lunchroom. Lunchrooms and coffee pots are profane. doesn't mean they're evil, but they're profane. They're not consecrated. They're not set aside for the worship of God. And they turn, to, turn a Catholic church into a place to sit around and chat and drink coffee is a profanity, to put it mildly. But even if that were fixed, the architecture was still profane. We'll just look at one point for the sake of time, although there's plenty. In a properly designed Catholic church, as I've mentioned to many of you before, whether you're in the Eastern Rite or in the Latin Rite, there are three divisions of space. The vestibule out there, the nave where y'all are sitting, and the sanctuary up here. Three divisions of space. They're all missing in that church. The kind of reverence that we Catholics are supposed to have for tradition is rooted in a profound appreciation, finally, for the fourth commandment. It's an attitude that our fathers in faith did things this way, and they know more than we do. And we realize if they do things in a certain way, it's for a darn good reason, even if we don't know what that reason was. So we leave gates the way we found them. And if every Catholic church, traditionally throughout the world, in whatever right you're in, has those three divisions of space, there's a pretty good reason for it, even if you don't cotton on to what it might be. So what are the reasons for the three spaces in a church? Well, among other things, a Catholic church symbolizes, or symbolically portrays in its architecture, creation. It's reality tipped on its side or tipped flat. See, when God created everything, he created heaven, earth, and the underworld. There's three levels of reality, heaven, earth, and underworld. So the whole church has just been tipped. I'm standing in what's liturgical heaven. Here on liturgical earth, the liturgical underworld is a vestibule. We know that already. What does that mean for us, though, practically speaking? It means as we draw closer to God by moving from out into the world into the vestibule, our behavior has to start changing. It has to change according to where we're at. And then when we move from the vestibule into the nave, our behavior has to become more reverent. And if we're in the sanctuary, we're so close to God that we're in a totally different world. These three places have three different degrees of holiness required. You don't need me to tell you that when you're in the vestibule, you don't have to behave the same as in the nave. That's why we take little kids who don't know that yet back there. They're making noise. They don't know how to, they're carrying on. They don't know how to behave. But out here, that's one type of behavior. And then up here in the sanctuary, to even come up here during ceremonies, we have to have on special clothing and act in special ritualistic ways because we're in the holiest place. And then, of course, the priest has to have on the most specialized vestments, all of which are consecrated specifically for use at the altar and all of which have special prayers that the priest says as he's putting them on. And then the priest has the most specialized and complicated ritualistic ways of acting. And why is that? Because when a man comes closer to God, the God who is ineffably holy, the accountability of that man increases. There's a sort of a balance or a tension we have to keep in mind when we approach God. On the one hand, God loves us with an infinite, incredible love. He's numbered every hair on our heads. He wants us to have a close and personal loving relationship with Him. That's on the one hand, and we don't want to forget that. But on the other hand, we also have to keep in mind that this God is completely and unutterably holy, which means that as we approach Him, we have to be ever more careful to watch our behavior and not step over any lines across any boundaries. So on the one hand, He loves us infinitely. On the other hand, He's infinitely pure and holy. So look at how the men who work closest to God spend so many years, seven years in my case, going through a series of consecrations, being set ever farther apart 
from the world, being set ever farther apart from the rescue, giving up all kinds of natural goods in pursuit of holiness. And all this is done precisely so that we can work up here safely. So we can safely take your pleas to God and bring his message back down to you. So we can work in the person of Christ and not be a scandal or a stumbling block for all y'all. Think what else this closeness means to a priest. On the one hand, he's called to this intimacy with God. It means God has an incredible love for him. On the other hand, it means that infractions committed by a priest up on the altar are judged far, far more seriously than those committed by anyone else anywhere else. Why? Because these sins are committed by an official representative of God and they're committed in the holiest place in the universe and they're committed right in God's face. That's not any place for goofing around. A priest has important business to tend to with God and it's dangerous. Everybody knows the saying, familiarity breeds contempt. We priests spend our life amongst divine things. We of all men have to be especially careful not to treat holy things profanely. Just to give you some idea of how serious it is, the rubrics for the Mass bind me under the pain of mortal sin. That means I don't come up with any big ideas. I better just leave Gates the way I found them. You may notice that before I go back in the confessional after Mass, I kneel down there for a little while. You know why? Because there's a little prayer. It's in the Missal or it's also in, in my breviary. And it's promulgated by a St. Pius X. It has the condition that if I say this prayer while I'm on my knees, the punishment due to my accidental infractions of the rubrics that are caused by human weakness will be remitted. The punishment due to me for my accidental infractions. Unfortunately, even though I practiced for almost a year dry masses when I was a deacon, sometimes up to four a day, I've been saying mass for coming on two years now, uh, and I really try to follow the rubrics without a mistake, and I'm not proud of it. I haven't had a flawless mass yet. It's hard to do. Anyway, priests aren't the only ones called to holiness, are they? The nave and the vestibule are still holy places that have been set apart for the worship of God. So the behavior there has to correspond to the holiness of the place we're in, or we can be just as guilty of profanity there. That's what irreverent thoughts, words, or deeds are in a Catholic church. They're profaning a holy place. And remember, what we do in here determines what goes on out in the world. This is a floodgate for graces. This is where we get everything we need to turn the world around. It flows from the altar out, and we take it out of here. So the basic problem with that little coffee house church is its profanity captured in architecture. Just think about it. After the fall, Adam was driven from the sanctuary of the garden and God stationed cherubim there with flaming swords to keep him away. When Moses went up to Mount Sinai, God said if anyone else approached the sanctuary or touched the holy mountain, he'd die. In the temple... In Jerusalem, there were Levites standing there with drawn swords. So if someone tried to wander in the sanctuary, they were supposed to kill them. The holiness of God is so absolute that after the fall of Adam, he couldn't be safely approached. It wasn't just spiritually dangerous to approach God. It was actually physically dangerous. If the high priest survived the Day of Atonement, he had a party. Because if he made a liturgical error, he was struck dead. That's why when he went in behind the curtain, they had a rope tied on his leg, and he had little bells on his cassock so they could hear, because they couldn't go in there either. And if the bells quit ringing, they reeled him in, because they know he messed up. God means business. And that's the same God right there. That's the same God. God never changes. So what happened? If he never changes, what's protecting us now? His only begotten Son became a man. And He's interceding for us right now and protecting us from the righteous wrath of His Father. Let's not forget, though, that when our Lord became man and He was visibly present 2,000 years ago, He hid His divinity and it took faith, lots of faith, to believe that carpenter nailed on a cross was God the Son 
the second person of the most blessed trinity. It took faith. And now he's hidden both his divinity and his humanity under the appearances of bread and wine. And it takes faith. Lots of faith to believe that that host in the tabernacle is a body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But we do believe. And since we believe, we have to express this inner belief in our outward actions. We have to express it because there's a rule. Either our actions will follow our beliefs or our beliefs are going to follow our actions. Don't ever forget that rule. It'll keep you out of hell. Either our actions follow our beliefs or our beliefs are going to turn around and start following our actions. So don't tell me those people believe that's God when the best they can do, the very best they can do for God himself is build a little ugly tabernacle and stuff him off in the corner behind a potted plant, catty corner at the same level as a bunch of coffee pots, and then ignore him and turn their back to him while they're talking about cattle prices and drinking coffee. Do we believe that that's the way we're acting? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. Our Lord said, My Father's house should be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. What would he say now? My Father's house should be a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a coffee shop? The Catholic Church is a holy place, and everything about it has to speak and teach holiness. It's the house of God, and it's the gate of heaven. It's the house of God, and it's the gate of heaven. Now, a few months have gone by since I was asked about the proper rubrics for faithful at high and low mass. Thanks for the prayers. I'm not solemn. We'll take a quick look at some background information before we tackle that. For the sake of time, I'll just hit the high points. Starting around World War I, certain members of the liturgical movement concluded that there was an artificial division that had somehow developed over time between the ordained priesthood and the common priesthood of the faithful. This is an idea that flies in the face of Scripture and tradition, and it resonates very strongly with the Protestants. Anyway, ideas have consequences, and this one is certainly no exception. It's resulted, among other things, in the notion that everything and every place and everyone is equally holy. And that mistake has produced, among other things, whacked coffeehouse architecture for churches. So we've got the whacked idea that everything is equally holy. And then in order to close this supposed artificial division between the ordained priesthood and the priest of the faithful, we're led to smudge the differences and move everyone towards the middle, so to speak. What does that mean? To some degree, it means priests acting like laity, and in the Mass, it especially means laity acting more like priests. The result has been an upsurge of a weird sort of clericalism, as if the only important people in church are the clerics. As Cardinal Newman said, the church would like mighty foolish without the faithful. We're not the only... <laughs> we're doing this for you. There's a symmetry here. We're doing it for you. You have the babies. You, you give natural life, and we bring su supernatural life to you. It's a deal. So, I mean, there's a symmetry here. At any rate, it's this weird idea that everybody has to act very priest-like. It crushes, in so many cases, a true piety and devotion of many classes, Catholics, and attempts to replace it with a strange idea that to fully participate at Mass means having a ministerial or a quasi-ministerial role. This is something that Venerable Pius XII warned against. It's also resulted in insistence that everyone has to be reading a missal. Now get me right, there's nothing wrong with a missal. It's great to read a missal, but there's nothing wrong with being illiterate either in the Catholic Church. I never heard that you had to know how to read to be a good Catholic. Most of us didn't know how to read when we were little anyway. So there's nothing wrong with a missal, but it's not absolutely essential to be keeping up with what the priest is doing. If you hit a neat place in the missile and it starts moving your spirit, sit there and think about that. That's what you can do. I have a job to do. I can't just stop and start having, you know, private devotions. You can. At any rate, there's nothing wrong with the illiterate Catholics. There's nothing wrong with rosaries or prayer books or these other devotions, as Pius XII also pointed out. So that gives us a little context for discussing rubrics. First off, what are they? Rubrics are rules that we have to follow. We meaning the priest and the servers up here. To render the official word, worship to God in a manner that's pleasing to Him. It tells me how I'm supposed to place my hands 
where I'm supposed to be looking with my eyes, the volume of my voice, and so forth. Because the whole Mass is a vocal prayer. I have to say everything out loud, but as you've gathered by now, you can't hear everything I say. All that's determined by the rubrics, which apply directly to those of us up here. They also apply to clerics sitting in choir. Like when the deacon's sitting here, here's a cleric in choir. That's not a clerical choir, a liturgical choir there. A clerics in choir, like monks or priests or clerics, they're sitting up here. And you can pick them out because they wear choir dress. That's what all the altar boys are wearing is choir dress, a, a, ca a satan or a cassock and, and, uh, and whatnot. At any rate, uh, rubrics uh, apply to clerics in choir, priests, and the servers. Now, the funny, here's the funny part you might not know, so please listen to the whole explanation. Strictly speaking, there is no such thing as rubrics for the faithful. And why is that? Because you're assisting at Mass in the nave. That's not bad. That's why you're in the nave. I'm up here working in liturgical heaven, and you're down there on liturgical earth, and I come down from the mouth of law. Let me explain that briefly. Custom is so highly valued in the mind of the church that if it's a venerable custom, say it's lasted a century or longer, then even if it's against the law, it overrides the rubrics. I'll give you a concrete example. When you see the, the guys coming in, there's a crucif here. You have one guy carrying the cross, but two altar boys doing it. We do that in America, but that's against the rubrics. But it would be against the law to get rid of it. It's everywhere else in the world that I know of anyway. That's only for a bishop. Only a bishop rates a crucifer going in. But everywhere in America, it's the custom in America, and it would actually be wrong to change that, because that's how we do things in America. So that's a nationwide one that we do right here within our borders. The Australians in our seminary, the Frenchmen, they've never seen this thing before, and they're all freaking out, say, well, you're in America right now. That's how we do it here. And it would be wrong to do it the Australian way or the French way, because it's in America. Anyway. Custom is so highly valued that if it's a venerable custom, it has the force of law. Not knowing this can often lead to somewhat amusing situations. Uh, since I've joined the fraternity, I've worked directly under four different priests, all from another country, all of whom were very insistent that the one and only correct set of 1962 rubrics that the faithful must be used at Mass were the ones they had. But you might guess that out of the four different priests, they had four different sets of rubrics, even up at the altar. And even from a small country like theirs, that has about one-sixtieth of the practicing Catholic population as ours, they still have a lot of different local customs. And that's fine. That's how the Catholic Church is. For example, the altar boys, I'm told, in Lyon do a little curtsy to the priest instead of a bow. Now, that's fine in Lyon, but you're going to be looking for a new priest if any of these guys start curtsying to me. Anyway... There's an ancient principle we've all heard. St. Paul puts it, when in Rome, do as the Romans. And so after prayer and reflection, it seems to me that's the only possible principle to invoke. When in Rome, do as the Romans. Being as this is America, I've just put together, and I'm not saying it's infallible, a typical American posture is for low and high mass. That's the obvious choice. There's a little handout available. It's probably pretty close to what everybody has in their hand missiles. That's the, the liturgical business. Let's close with a thought from St. Francis of Sisi about holiness, about true holiness at the holy sacrifice of the Mass. St. Francis said, Man should tremble, the world should quake, all heaven should be deeply moved when the Son of God appears on the altar in the hands of the priest. So prepare yourself.